will be interviewing Walter and Elsie Kalis. In May of 2015, Walter had a heart attack, and so I'm going to ask them a couple of questions about it. Did you have any signs leading up to the heart attack? Um, I didn't recognize the signs at the time, but a couple of days, about three days before that, I was um, experiencing a little bit of chest pain. Um, couldn't sleep that night. I actually came downstairs and sat on the couch and watched TV. And um, I think that was the first time I recognized that uh, I had a little discomfort, but never thought of a heart attack. Mm -hmm. Elsie, do you remember this? I do. I remember uh, that night where he was very restless and couldn't sleep. And um, I wondered whether I should take him to the hospital, but he kept saying, oh, I'm fine, oh, I'm fine, and came down here and watched TV. And, you know, the next morning we just went on with our lives, and he went to work, and I went to work, and we didn't think anything of it. Describe the day that the heart attack occurred. Well, uh, it was a Sunday afternoon. Mm -hmm. uh, very nice day. We took a ride to Narragansett. We had lunch. Uh, we drove back, and Elsie took our dog for a walk. And I was sitting down, and I started feeling a little uncomfortable. So I went upstairs, and the next thing I knew was uh, firemen were kind of putting me on a stretcher. Uh, I really don't remember anything. Uh, after that or before that? Um, when I came back from the walk, um, he wasn't sitting down here like he normally would be watching TV, so I decided to go upstairs and check on him. And I found him uh, on his knees, kind of slumped over the bed, trying to um, catch his breath. He was having a very hard time breathing. And, um, and I was asking, he was, he was conscious, and I was asking him what was wrong, and he didn't know, and he kept trying to gasp for air. So uh, I immediately called 911 and told them, you know, what I encountered, and they said they'd be here, you know, a minute or two. And um, so they came. They um, saw that he was in a lot of distress. Um, they, uh, I can't remember if they laid them laid him down or, you know, put him in a transport chair because we were up on the third floor, so they were going to have to transport him out. And they immediately put oxygen on him because that was the thing that he was saying. Um, and even with the oxygen mask on, he was panic-stricken. He, he didn't even feel that that was helping the situation. He felt very um, panicked by the situation. And he was breaking out in a sweat and just... Um, very pale um, and and just like not understanding what was going on and um, so this entire time he's still conscious and they um, once they got him in the chair with some oxygen they carried him down the three flights of stairs and, and took him to the rescue um, meanwhile uh, they were going to take him right to Newport Hospital which is you know like five minutes away and um, so I was taking care of a few things here at home and didn't know um, that on their way to the hospital he had flatlined so that immediately the EMTs had to perform CPR and try to um, get him breathing again and his heart pumping um, so um, when I got to the hospital they tried to prepare me before I went in to see him because they were still working on him. Yeah. And he was not in the state that I had seen him because he was still conscious when I had last seen him, but now he was not. So um, they led me into the uh, emergency room area where he was and they were working on him. They were pounding on his chest, they were um, taking out paddles, they were um, doing all the things you see on TV and so on. <laughs> is having a cardiac episode um, and just hoping and praying that they could make his heart stop beating again because he looked like it wasn't going to happen yeah. and so
that was pretty much that part of it. But they did get his heart started, yes. What procedure was done in order to take action to this heart attack? Um, we were told that he had two um, uh, clogged arteries that um, needed to be cleaned out and stents uh, put in. The stents um, have somewhat a uh, life lifespan of maybe 10 years, maybe longer. Um, and uh, because of that, you have to take a blood thinner for at least a year um, to make sure your blood keeps flowing and that the plaque doesn't build up again. Mm -hmm. um, and also, um, I think it should be said that um, Walter had um, regular doctor's visits, but nothing was uh, caught before it happened. Mm -hmm. What other issues came into effect while he was in the hospital? Um, well, they diagnosed what the problem was, that um, the uh, effects of the heart attack could be uh, remedied by putting in stints. Mm -hmm. And so they did emergency surgery and took care of that. Um, also, um, it was a matter of time to see how he would um, respond, because we didn't know how long he was without oxygen, for sure. Um, when the heart attack happened, so um, he had to wait a few days. Um, meanwhile, after his surgery, he was put in an induced coma state and had uh, he was on a ventilator, um, and he had many things plugged into him to keep him going. Um, the first 48 hours, he seemed to um, be doing okay, and then things started to happen that weren't good. Um, he developed pneumonia, um, he, and maybe another infection besides that. Um, then he began to have issues with um, his um, organ function, like liver and kidney. Um, so they had to, still in the coma state, still deal with all these things. So at one point they had to put him on a continuous dialysis machine for um, two or three days to help filter the toxins out of his body. Um, meanwhile, he was extremely medicated. He was heavily medicated. And um, you just don't know what someone can hear or can't hear when you're there and you're um, speaking to them. Um, doctors were very good at Miriam Hospital at explaining what was going on, um, what they were doing to help save his life. Um, and to be quite honest, things looked very bleak that first week mm -hmm. that um, all this was going on. Um, once they got the uh, pneumonia under control, then it seemed that the um, dialysis wasn't needed anymore and they were going to start weaning him off of the drugs and uh, pulling, the, um, ven pulling the ventilator out. Um, and see, you know, what his function would be, because we really didn't know what his function would be. Um, and one one positive thing was they would always say, oh, you know, he's bucking the vent, so he must have some consciousness. He knows that he wants to come back, you know, um, because he would um, bite down on the, the mouthpiece, the ventilator mouthpiece, and, and the alarms would go off constantly, and he would, um, you know, jerk around in movement somewhat, um, and they would say, oh, he's bucking the vent, so that's a good thing, that's a good thing, that means he's still got some brain function, he's um, trying to get better, mm -hmm. he's trying to get better. So it was just a matter of time, and I think we had to wait maybe 12 days um, before they were willing to start pulling machines off, and, mm -hmm. and then it was uh, a wait and see as to what his recovery would be like. Um, once they um, saw that he was doing okay, uh, he was breathing on his own, and um, I think could answer some simple questions and things, um, they felt that um, he could be removed from the ICU and could be put in a, a regular room. Mm -hmm. And then we had to start thinking about uh, rehabilitation because he had been in this um, comatose state for 12 days, if not longer, and um, is going to have to 
learn how to do everything all over again because he had been um, hospitalized for so long or, or in bed for so long. Mm -hmm. um, after that, um, it was a slow progression of getting better um, each day, but um, due to the um, trauma he received with them trying to revive him, he had broken a lot of ribs, um, so um, breathing was a little difficult and painful for him, and uh, his cognitive ability took a little while. Um, he had grand delusions about things because of all the medications um, he was on, and but started to um, come along a little bit better each day. Um, we did notice it took him a while before he could use um, his, his right hand to um, feed himself. He was having an issue with that in the beginning. Um, so that prompted us to ask more questions, like could he have had a stroke? Could something else have happened? And I believe that they did determine he uh, had also um, suffered a stroke in that process of being, um, who knows when it took place. Um, and, you know, so those were some other things to overcome. And, um, once uh, he was assessed, um, then we had to figure out where we would send him to rehabilitate. And that's when um, we contacted um, Newport Hospital, their Vanderbilt Rehabilitation Center. And um, they were, um, luckily had an open bed that could accommodate him, which made life much easier for me, not having to drive to Providence uh, every day to see him. Um, and they did excellent, excellent work. He was there for five weeks? Five, five to six weeks. Yeah. Five to six weeks and uh, learning how to do things over again, learning um, how to put his thoughts together and how to dress himself and walk and talk and wash himself and just learning living all over again. Mm -hmm. um, and this all takes time and it takes um, a lot of help from a lot of other people um, and it was determined at one time which you know Walter should tell you um, that they never thought he'd work again they didn't think his mind would have the capability of, of doing it at the level that he did before so. how has your lifestyle changed after having your heart attack Wow, um, changes a lot, it really does. I think you become more aware of life and of life ending. Um, I had a shortness of breath for about a year, which was very difficult. You walk up a flight of stairs and, and you're having a tough time breathing. And I think you're always cognizant of the fact that this could happen again. And I don't know if it does, you're going to be strong enough to be able to fight the whole thing with that. Mm -hmm. But as time goes by, it's been a year and a half now, I don't think about those things. I don't have shortness of breath anymore. Mm -hmm. uh, I'm at the Vanderbilt gym three days a week, working out with everyone, being able to uh, push machines pretty well. And um, I just go on my daily routine. Um, had a lot of support from family, and uh, I'll never forget that. Mm -hmm.